Hello, everyone. This is another episode of the Unisoft Question, a uh, YouTube show and a podcast about lawyers, where I interview interesting lawyers and mostly litigators for uh, lately, because I'm a litigator and I'm curious and interested in litigators. So today we have a really special litigator, lawyer, personality. Uh, his name is Andrew Bernstein, and I'm sure most of you know him, either by virtue of your membership in this profession or because you're on Twitter. Uh, without further ado, uh, hello, Andrew. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. It's really great to have you. And I've always wanted to do this interview and I wanted to build, you know, some experience before I could approach you and ask you to come. But on the other hand, for some reason, I was sure you would say yes, because you're just a very approachable person. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I've never been... Uh... I've never been one of those people, I think, who holds myself in any way kind of apart from everyone else. I, you know, I'm part of a profession that I'm very proud to be part of. And I'm, the reason I'm proud to be part of it is because of all the great people in it. Right. I want to go back to your roots. And uh, from um, the way you hold yourself and uh, from some other hallmarks, I would say you're from Toronto. I am. I born and raised in Toronto, lived almost my whole life here, other than a few years in school and in different places and a year in Ottawa. Right. So what is the first of, first of all, uh, what neighborhood of Toronto are you from? I grew up around Spadina and Eglinton uh, and attended Forest Hill Collegiate as, uh, for high school uh, and uh, still live not too far from there. I, I live at Bathurst and Eglinton now. I have a strange question for you, but maybe it won't be so strange for those who are like me, our arrivals to Toronto. What is it like to be from Toronto and to live and work in Toronto at the same time and to be from Toronto, right? It, it feels like home. Uh, it feels very, very comfortable. I, I've always loved Toronto. When I was in law school, there was kind of a big movement towards people moving either to New York or to the Bay Area uh, to practice law at, you know, either a Sullivan and Cromwell or a Wilson Sonsini. And that was never my cup of tea. I, I've, I love those places. I visit those places often, or at least I did in pre-pandemic times. I even managed to get a year at UC Berkeley for school, which I love, but I never seriously contemplated living in the long term anywhere else. Yet, despite your loyalty to the city, you went to McGill for your undergrad. Yeah, I was uh, I was 18 and it was time to get out of here for a few years and see what the rest of the world was like. Um, you know, had the uh, benefit of parents who were extremely supportive of my uh, going away to school. And I love those years at McGill. Uh, every time I hear about somebody going off to McGill, for their uh, for their undergrad, I get a little just a little jealous. Why economics? Uh, might have been a failure of imagination. Um, I had a teacher in high school that I really really liked. I, I mean, let's take a step back. I grew up in the 1980s. I'm born in '71. I'm turning 50 this year. Uh, don't don't be fooled by the baby face. Uh, so I grew up in the 80s, and it's actually interesting to, to look back at that era and think uh, about what we thought was cool. And what we thought was cool in some ways was uh, that, you know, high-flying uh, Wall Street kind of lifestyle that we saw on TV and the movies. I, mean, the mo I, remember, I have a very clear memory of going to see the movie Wall Street at the uh, Canada Square Theater at Young and Eglinton. And, uh, you know, so I went into, I, I my dad's a, an obstetrician and I had for some period of time thought that I would try and be a doctor. Basically when I say until some, for some period of time, until I did grade 10 biology, which I just could not stand. I could not stand biology. It was all cell biology. I didn't like it. And although I found myself still interested in chemistry and took some chemistry through the end of high school, I 
the, the course that really captured my imagination in high school was economics. And so thanks to the inspiration of Mr. Zambrano, um, who always uh, did everything in reverse alphabetical order to my, uh, to my degree, um, I went off to McGill to do a commerce degree. I got to McGill and started taking these kind of intro to commerce courses, accounting, finance, and found that they weren't, they were maybe a little too hands-on practical for what I was interested in and was looking for a kind of a more theoretical and academic approach. And so McGill has this uh, arrangement where you can do your economics degree as a commerce, uh, as, as part of the commerce faculty. So I did my Bachelor of Commerce. Uh, I completed all of the essential prerequisites. and but you know, my major was, was economics. In retrospect, I, I don't, I don't regret it. I, I had a good experience, but if I were to do it all over again, knowing now what I, I sorry, knowing uh, then what I know now, I probably would have done poli sci and history. Uh, my favorite courses in undergrad were a, a course by Chris Manfredi, two courses by Chris Manfredi uh, called the Canadian judicial process and the Canadian constitution and uh, an American history course from Gil Troy. And I just, I, th they were they were my favorite by far. The things that I, were, I was the most interested in had a lot more passion for them than I turned out to have for economics. Not that I disliked economics, but uh, it you know, devolved at some level to a lot of math. Uh, and I love math, but you know, at some level the math stops being interesting. I'm curious. Do you like abstractions more than their concrete representations? Or do you like books more than printed course packs? Sorry if I'm being a little bit vague here. I'm just trying to understand why you had a tendency to theoretical subjects as opposed to hands-on subjects. So I would say that in you know you get to the commerce faculty and you do accounting one and marketing, intro to marketing and social psychology. And, you know, if what you wanna learn in your undergrad is how to run a business, these are not, these are not bad courses. Um, but if, you wanna, if what you wanna learn in your undergrad is something more about the world at large, then I think you miss the opportunity to learn something more about the world at large by focusing too heavily on what I would call technical or specialized courses. I mean, if, if you're gonna run a business, you better know some accounting. And uh, accounting one turned out to be very useful when I had to pass the bar accounting course because you know it was pretty easy compared to the to first year accounting. But in the end, you know, to me, I'm much more interested in um, I'm much more interested in a debate about the proper role of the judiciary than I am about understanding how to prepare a statement of changes in financial position. Other people may have totally different aptitudes and interests, and you know that's kind of what makes the world go round. But but that's just me. I I, I like the abstract. I'm I'm interested in ideas and uh, interested in I, I'm interested in how ideas affect the world, uh, and I'm interested in in how those ideas can be put into practice. And some parts of economics were a really great marriage of those things. Uh, you know I'm everyone kind of has an intuitive understanding of supply and demand, but economics, when at its best, explains why people behave the way they behave, how and how we can expect them to behave um, in response to particular incentives. And that's all fine. I'm, I'm all good with that. I, I think it's interesting. It's useful. There's some real insights that economics brings to all sorts of disciplines. Uh, but in the end, I, I just found myself more interested in uh, different different areas. You attended uh, universities in both Canada and the United States. In the United States, there is uh, a widespread uh, concept in education known as liberal arts education. I don't think this concept really exists in Canada. And in general, I, like for example, there is no. I don't think there is such a thing as uh, Bachelor of Commerce 
or or uh, or commerce degree in the states, right? So I, I believe uh, the liberal arts uh, education concept covers this idea that you were talking about that we are going to talk about the world the world at large in the first four years of your higher education and then in postgraduate education you you will choose your profession do you think this uh, distinction between Canada and the US is is valid or do you think I'm missing the point so I, I would have to plead a bit of ignorance. I, I did go to UC Berkeley for one year, but I was in the law school. So I didn't learn a heck of a lot about what was going on in the undergrads. Um, the, I know that, that certainly there are schools in the US where you can major in business. And I've read uh, statistics about how business is now the most popular major in the US, uh, you know, which kind of makes me unhappy in a, in a way and in another way I think people should study what they want to study so but um, but certainly I mean bachelors of commerce can be great things I, I, I don't I don't poo poo them for other people I just I know that personally I would have benefited from a, more of a liberal arts education than than I got and what I ended up doing for all intents and purposes was kind of carving myself a liberal arts education out of um, the commerce faculty by taking all of my electives in poli sci, history, English, music, things like that. Uh, and, and it was great, but I have to say that I remember a heck of a lot more about um, you know, American history than I do about the, uh, the niceties of um, you know, uh, the ISLM macroeconomic model. Um, so, I do remember my professor telling me that uh, the benefits of trade are the one thing that economists know for sure to be true that is not trivial. And uh, I thought that was a I thought that was a good line and it's, it's it certainly had an influence on me. I mean, the other thing about some of the commerce faculty stuff is that later as I've become more senior in my firm and take on taken on leadership roles, it's kind of come back to me a bit. So I took a course on organizational behavior and uh, didn't love it at the time, but it, man, it really stuck. And, and it's been something that I've drawn upon over the years. I took a course on uh, organizational policy. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm not senior enough at the firm. I'm, I've never been on the executive committee, but at the level of policy, but for somebody who was uh, in charge of the litigation department for five years, Again, you know, you, you draw on these things, whether you necessarily enjoyed them at the time. But on the other hand, you know, I took an entire course called operations management on how to optimize a production line. Um, it was, you know, 1992 and we were very concerned that Japanese production techniques were overtaking North American production techniques. Um, you know, this was before Japan entered a 25 year recession. So uh, some of it was was some of it was better than others, and and that's okay. It's all kind of a learning experience, right? You you figure out what you like and what you don't like, and what you're interested in and what you're not interested in. You know, uh, there was a moment in time when I was extremely good at telling you which intersection of lines was the furthest from the origin, um, in a course called operations research. But uh, I don't know how to do that anymore, and I, I don't miss it. What do you think is more valuable for someone to become an exceptional litigator or an exceptional lawyer? To have a broad liberal arts education as the grounding, as the foundation where you ask the big questions, uh, where you look at the first principles behind things or to have a more hands-on uh, training where you learn to uh, read cases and whatever they teach you in law school and in, in a more hands-on uh, undergraduate uh, program? I think to some extent, I'm gonna do the lawyerly thing and, and debate the question with you. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's, that's a, a dichotomy that I would personally draw. Uh, I think that the best lawyers um, to me are the ones that combine a whole range of skill sets. And, you know, I was, I had, I've been lucky enough to work with um, a wide variety of fabulous lawyers 
you know, so Sheila Block uh, is erudite and knowledgeable about the world and history and music and, and sh you know, she's, sh you never know when she's going to pull in a random reference um, by the, you know, as a, an attempt to persuade someone. And I think of, you know, maybe Ron Slatt, uh, who I have only been against, but uh, you know, like that as well. Um, you know, my, my longtime mentor, John B. Laskin, is laser focused. He's not one to kind of bring in outside references and things like that. But, you know, he was a brilliant reader and understander of the case law and, and a, a sort of a could in a, in a very unique way um, shape the narrative of the case law to, to help uh, win his client's cases. And then, you know, a, a million other people, my, my colleague, Linda Plumpton, who's just a few years senior to me, but I also consider a mentor. Um, I don't know anyone who can keep the details of a case in her head quite as well as Linda. She knows, she remembers everything. You'll have a call with her with a client, you'll have a call three months later and she will remember everything that the client told her the last time. And I'm scrambling through my notes going, he, did he say that? Did he say that? So I think there's lots of roots to being a great lawyer. Uh, there's no one personality type or disposition that's required other than, you know, what those three people have in common is an enormous capacity for hard work. Can you tell if someone is poised to be a great lawyer? I, I assume that when you hire people at your firm, you at least partially look for future great lawyers. I, 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 there are probably other hiring objectives, but they must be part of, of, the, of the goal here is to find future um, uh, outstanding lawyers. How do you, how, what do you look for? So I would say that Firms in general have many objectives in hiring. Um, and I don't, obviously, I've never made those decisions unilaterally, even when I was the department head. Um, I've never, you know, it's always been a consultative process. But when I personally hire, um, I, I hire for brains. Um, I hire for analytical ability. I hire for you know, somebody who can string a few sentences together, of course, uh, you know, if you've, if, if, if somebody's kind of sitting there mute in an interview, um, it's, it's very hard to get to know them. Uh, although, you know, there's probably a bit of a, a bias there because I'm, I'm an extrovert and uh, we, we all have to worry about hiring ourselves. <laughs> uh, but uh, I personally hire I like analytical ability uh, because I think almost every aspect of the job, almost every other aspect of the job can be taught. I can tell you that I had no aptitude whatsoever, natural aptitude whatsoever as a cross-examiner when I started. Um, I shudder to think about what my early transcripts looked like uh, because that is not kind of the direction that I run to. Um, you know, I was a factum writer and an appeal argument creator and a, a motion, I was great at motions practice and uh, pretty good in exam in chief actually in terms of storytelling. But I, you have to teach, you, you have to, you can, you, there are a few, a few people who are natural cross examiners, but uh, most of us have to learn how to do it. And it is an eminently learnable skill. Every one of these skills that you need to be a litigator is learnable. If you're not, you know, great on your feet, somebody can teach you to be better. Uh, if you're, you know, not terrific with clients, somebody can teach you to be better. Um, there's every one of these skills can be learned, but I don't think that you can improve on someone's not raw analytical ability. And so, I look for raw analytical ability where wherever I can find it. Uh, and you know, the the people that I have mentored over the years um, ha have tended to be people with a lot of raw analytical ability. And uh, again, everybody has their own preferences, but that's that's one that I I personally look for. Well, this takes me to this 
a general issue of measuring lawyers. How do you actually measure raw analytical ability in a hiring process? How, uh, for example, I'm a little bit familiar with hiring in uh, software uh, development organizations, uh, tech companies, and so on. So they assign uh, problems, coding problems on the spot, right? So you have 20 minutes and you have to solve a coding problem. And there are whole books called um, uh, Succeeding in uh, Coding Interviews or something like that, right? And these books are basically uh, drill books with exercises. How do you measure raw analytical ability in a lawyer when you are considering uh, hiring that person? So, I mean, number one, you can't really measure raw analytical ability. Um, we, we, we're not at the point, um, and, and you know, maybe as a matter of, of uh, equity in hiring, we should be at the point, but we're not at the point where we um, give people tests uh, in interviews. Uh, but what I try and do is I try and engage people in a discussion about some something, some, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be legal in nature, something that interests them, something that they're passionate about, and, and just ask questions that tries to measure their analytical ability, their, their interest in kind of the world around them. And th that's what I personally do. Um, and then, you know, in a big firm environment, we're pretty lucky because the pre-screening that takes place with transcripts and with resumes, you know, most of the people that walk in the door, um, you're choosing from a pretty great uh, collection of students. So, I, you know, but I personally, I engage people in a discussion about something and, and just try and push them a little bit to understand how far they wanna, how far they wanna take it. Um, there's lots of, again, everybody's practice is different, right? And everybody's preferences are different. Um, I've interviewed with people who have said to me, oh, this person played a lot of team sports. That's great. That's a great sign. You know, it means that they're, it means that they're a real team player. And I'm like, I never played a team sport in my life. I'm hopelessly uncoordinated. And, uh, I've always thought, geez, if, if you're looking for team sports, you're just looking for a jock. Uh, but, you know, everyone's got their own, everyone's got their own preferences. And that's why we do these things, to be honest, as a, as a group, because, uh, you know, number one, uh, equity in hiring is in the last 10 years become incredibly important um, for good reason. And, you know, you have to make sure you're not just hiring yourself, which everybody is tempted to do. And number two, um, you know, if, if you let one person make these decisions, you're just going to get one kind of candidate. And in a firm like ours, where we're hiring maybe 20 students in a year, we want a broad diversity of skill sets and a broad diversity of, of people. It's just, I know that the people that I'm drawn to are the people that um, really like to pick apart a problem, you know, just keep pulling at the threads and pulling at the threads and pulling at the threads until they've, until they've, you know, satisfactorily solved the problem. Because that's how I practice. I just, I keep pulling at the threads and, uh, and, uh, you know, often that's a great way to practice. And sometimes it results in me writing off a bunch of time. You mentioned transcripts. Uh, this is one, I guess, measure that uh, claims to be a, a more objective than a personal opinion, for example. And uh, I know that you were a gold medalist at U of T in law school. How do you become a gold medalist in law school? What does it take? Uh, there is an aura of mystery around uh, law students who get only A's or only A pluses in law school. Dispel that aura for us. Sure. Uh, I walked into law school with, and the first, one of the first people I encountered was the uh, smartest woman in my high school class. She had been uh, a brilliant student all through high school. She had uh, 
gone on to a, an Ivy League school in the US and then come back to U of T Law. And so I wondered, I, I, I wondered, I, you know, everyone knew that uh, law school was the time that you, you jam a bunch of A students together and give them all Bs. Um, so I, I wondered, you know, how is this all going to shake out? You couldn't, I, I am, U of T, this was back in the era when U of T had fake exams in at Christmas and real six, your entire year was basically dictated by six exams that you wrote in April. And uh, I had written my exams. I thought they went fine. Uh, my fake exams, I thought they went fine. Um, I studied hard. I, I was always a, a diligent student in law school. You know, I used to, it, it's, it's amazing to think about this, but of course nobody had a laptop or there was one guy with a laptop and everybody thought he was kind of weird. He was called laptop guy. And, uh, and so I used to take notes and then I used to go home and kind of type up my notes in my enormous, I believe it was a 386 um, <laughs> chip uh, PC with uh, you know a monitor with a tube that probably was um, 17 inches across and 25 inches deep. And I used to sit in my parents' attic, uh, which is where we kept the, the household computer, because of course there was only one computer in the household, and type up my notes. And that would kind of be my summary. And then before the exams, I tried to sort of integrate those summaries into what I called short summaries, um, which were a more, I would say, analytical approach to what these cases were about. So it wasn't just a description of the case. It was like, what, what are we trying to get out of these cases and how do these rules fit together? And somebody had given me a, somebody's four page guide to federalism and I, sort of tried to replicate that idea with a bunch of different with a bunch of different cases. So I wrote my exams and I thought they went fine and I had the same reaction to every other um, every I had the same reaction as every other law student, which was basically I'm glad these exams were fake because they aren't really like anything that I had written before and and uh, you know we'll we'll kind of continue on and I had prepared myself for a bunch of Bs. And then I got a phone call from um, from the late Joan Lax, who was the dean of students at the time, um, before she became a judge, and and obviously she passed away a few years ago, which was a real tragedy. And I got this call from from Joan Lax, who I had known um, before law school. Um, when I was a kid, I got sent to Hebrew school on Sundays uh, to learn a little religion and and a little Hebrew, so I could have a bar mitzvah. And I was in a carpool with uh, with a few families, and and Joan uh, was one of them. So I knew Joan, and Joan knew me, and and um, she's a she's a first cousin to my mom's best friend, and you know a whole thing. So Joan called me up and was like, Andrew, uh, you you aced your exams, and I was like, well, that's really nice. And she's like, no, no, Andrew, you aced your exams. We don't see marks like this. And I was like, holy shit, like I you know I had no idea. I didn't tell anybody about this um, uh, because, of course, uh, nobody wants to be the guy who aces their Christmas exams and then, uh, you know, falls back into the pack uh, in the middle uh, after your after your final exams. Uh, so I just kind of kept this to myself. Except I did apply for a few summer jobs on the basis of those marks. Didn't get any uh, law firm jobs on the basis of those marks. But uh, Professor Trebilko uh, hired me as his RA, which I enjoyed, um, and uh, went and wrote my exams at Christmas and, and uh, by and large duplicated my results. So there, uh, there is, I, I couldn't tell anyone how to do better on a law school exam because it's always felt like, um, it's always felt like luck that I, happen to have the right kind of brain that works for law exams. It's never felt like anything other than, you know, I, I work hard and I encourage all law students to work hard, but but I it's never felt like anything but but by and large luck. And I remember the person who was and and back in the day, U of T uh, was not shy about publicizing 
who did well. Okay, so with your grades, you would get a package this thick of awards listings. And they were listed in a way so that you could tell, you know, kind of who were first to 11th in your law school class, and then who had won prizes in particular awards. And the person who was second in my first year class, um, she was a, um, a mom of two kids. And I remember her telling me before the exam, you know, I just don't have a lot of time to study. Like I've got to, I've got to take care of my kids. And so I often think like she must have been the smartest person in our law school class, right? Because like there I was 24 years old, nothing but my own self to think about. I was even living with my parents. Um, so, you know, my mom uh, made us dinner every night. Like it was a very cushy life that I lived in first year law. And, you know, there was my classmate Miriam who had two kids to manage and barely had time to study. And there she was coming second in the class. So, so uh, anyway, it's, th there's a whole bunch of factors. Uh, I think a lot of it is just, does your brain work a particular way? And then there's a whole bunch, I think, of socioeconomic factors, right? Are you lucky enough to be, um, you know, comfortable, not worried about uh, where your next meal is coming from? Do you have to work 20 hours a week to support yourself? Uh, you know, all of those things, I think, uh, hurt people's marks. And, and I know that when we screen for grades at, 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 the, at the firm level, we're certainly looking for reasons why people may not have done as well as some of their peers, because uh, grades aren't everything. They, they, they tell a story, but they don't tell the whole story. You mentioned Joan Lax and uh, knowing uh, her family. Did you know her son, John, by any chance? Yeah, he was the carpool member. He was me. in the carpool, right? Yeah, I know yeah. Him, I, the I designer. haven't seen him. I haven't seen John Lax in, well, I think since his mom's Shiva, unfortunately. But uh, And I hadn't seen him for 20 years before that. But yeah, we were all in a carpool together. He lives in California now. Is that right? Yeah, he uh, he's with Facebook. Oh, wow. He was always yeah. a nice guy, and and obviously I run into Cliff from time to time. He's a nice guy, and you know, very sad for all of them that their mom died so young. He he had he has the raw analytical ability. Uh, John Lax. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if you believe in genetics, as a, uh, it's no surprise. Yeah. So uh, after law school, you went to the Supreme Court of Canada, of course, gold medalist. I'm. Sure, that's, you know, that's the profile that they look for also, probably uh, very high grades, um, intelligence. Um, Supreme Court of Canada, was it everything you uh, hoped it would be or was it completely different? Uh, so uh, one of the person I replaced, at, you know, basically the way it works is you show up at the Supreme Court and you show up a day or two before your replacement leaves. And so, and, and what you do for a day or two is you share a desk with them as they kind of show you the ropes, or this is at least what happened in 1997. I have no idea what happens now. Um, so they just kind of show you the ropes, explain to you what your judge might want. And uh, the guy who I replaced said to me, oh, you'll see how sausage is made. And uh, I loved my year at the Supreme Court of Canada. Chief Justice Lemaire was at the end of his career and, um, you know, was not as engaged as some other judges with the clerks. But when he did engage with us, it was always a treat. He was brilliant. Uh, and, you know, I think at the end, he was a bit of a controversial figure. But, but in fact, I think he retained his brilliance uh, throughout. Uh, I think he was uh, a real inspiration to a lot of aspects of Canadian criminal law. His, uh, and then I, I got there and um, Delgamuk had been heard but hadn't been decided yet. And obviously that's all kind of inside baseball, but I can say that he was extremely passionate about Indigenous issues uh, at, at the, at which were then called Aboriginal law back then. Um, but, uh, but he was extremely, extremely passionate about these issues. And I had, I had never spent five minutes thinking about them 
Um, they were not mandatory. I don't think we learned them in constitutional law. I think Jim Phillips taught us a little bit about Aboriginal title in property law um, to his credit. But, uh, but uh, you know, and so it was inspiring to work with somebody who was, I think, uh, maybe just a little bit ahead of his time uh, on the importance of these issues. And, you know, just, and also just so interested in criminal law. The thing that happened the year that I was there that got more attention than anything else was the Quebec secession reference. And, and that was, so being at the Supreme Court of Canada for the Quebec secession reference, you know, that's, it's, that's a treat, right? That's a treat. And uh, the Attorney General of Saskatchewan, uh, who I think was called White, I think his name was John White, but I'm, I may be misremembering this, stood up and said, a thousand acts of accommodation are the threads that weave together the fabric of a nation. And I am waiting to deliver sometime in my career a line that eloquent on a issue that consequential because it's stuck with me. I mean, it's stuck with me. And I think, you know, a thousand acts of accommodation are probably the thread that weave together the fabric of, of all things. Um, and if certainly if you've been married, uh, as I have for almost 25 years, you know that they're the threads that weave together the fabric of a family. And, and I just, I thought that that was so inspirational. But the real highlight of my clerking year is my clerking class. Um, there were probably 32 or 33 of us because people came and went uh, in January a bit. Most of us started in the summer, but people came and went in January a little bit. And out of the 32 of us, you know, 30 of us are still in touch with one another. And it's love when we see each other. It's, it's just, they are some of my, I don't see them as often as I'd like to, but they are some of my favorite people in the world are the people from my clerking class. You know, a couple of them are judges in Alberta now. Some of them are QCs uh, in, in provinces that still have QCs. Some of them are at the top levels of government. One of them is currently Stefan Perot, the chief electoral officer of Canada. And I had to help one of my colleagues, advise one of my colleagues when she tried, when she sued him last year for, for putting the election on a, on a Jewish holiday. But, uh, you know, I, they are a, just a wonderful group of people from around the country. I, I you know, you really, it's, it's a, a privilege. It's a privilege to work in the Supreme Court. It's a privilege to work for a judge of the Supreme Court. It's a particular privilege to work for the Chief Justice. Um, and I got to know uh, his executive legal officer, James O'Reilly, who's now a judge of the federal court, very, very well. But the best part of the whole year was the, the group of people. And, and uh, I hope some of them are watching because I just love them. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, you got called after your clerkship in 1998, I assume? 99. Back in the day, uh, you, we, we would finish articles in the summer. We'd do bar admission in the fall and get called January or February. So, so this, year, this year, it will be 22 or 23 years of practice for you? So it will be... I, I've finished... 22 years minus minus one for for California for Berkeley so 21 right. years of practice and one year of grad school did you go straight to Tories after Supreme Court of Canada I did I um I had applied to go to grad so I got married between second and third year law school and uh we we moved in together of course having been married uh for third year and my wife had a job that she um, she liked uh, uh, it was a good job, um, but I think she we had thought that after and she didn't want to give up her job and she didn't want to move to Ottawa where she didn't really have anything going on, so we did the commuting thing for a year and I think she had thought, you know what her job she liked it she didn't love it, um, but uh, she thought maybe that after my Supreme Court clerkship we would go to grad school and, and we would both do grad school together. Um, and 
what happened in the middle of the year was that the firm that she had been working for dissolved and the partner that she really loved working for, um, this isn't a law firm, this is a, a corporate communications firm, uh, joined a bigger firm. And, and I think to this day, probably her favorite job ever was the job that she had at that new firm. And so she joined them in, in November, I remember because they, uh, we went to their Christmas party. <laughs> Uh, I came home from Ottawa to go to the firm Christmas party and meet her new colleagues. Uh, and she didn't want to, she loved that job and she didn't want to leave it um, to go off to grad school. And so I was like, oh, great. I love Tories and I, I wanted to go back there anyway. So I, um, I, I did. I went back to Tories and started practicing. Is most of your practice IP litigation or is it only a significant fraction of your practice? So it's varied dramatically over the years. Um, it's varied from, uh, you know, in the early years, it was probably a quarter. There were some years in the early part of the last decade, 2009, 10, 11, where it was probably 80%, 90% sometimes. And now it's kind of settled into about half about half, if you count the copyright, the patent and the trademark, it's about half and the other half is commercial litigation and public law. So. My impression of IP litigation uh, hiring is that law firms look for lawyers with science backgrounds. Uh, did, did, ec did the economics degree count as a science background for you? I've joked that uh, it should count for business method patents, but. Uh, so yeah. uh, the way I one got into click, one click by Amazon. Exactly, exactly. So so the the way I got into IP very sideways. Um, I I started at Tories in '99, and I I the very first case I got involved in was a case called Thompson and Robertson, um, which I got involved in because my mentor, my junior mentor, was a guy named Dave Folds, uh, and he was involved in the case and he said, hey, we need a junior. Do you want to be the junior? I was like, yeah, I want to be the junior. It sounds like a great case. So it had just been certified as a class action. And all of a sudden I was doing copyright law. The other thing is that I'd always had a bit of an interest in technology. Um, I'm not a technology person myself. I, you know, I couldn't code my way out of a paper bag unless it was in basic. Um, but uh, I've always had a sort of interest in the intersection of law and technology. And so if you're practicing in 1999, like, so Al Gore has only recently invented the internet, right? And uh, all of a sudden there were all of these issues going on, all of these legal issues that had to do with the intersection of law and technology. I wrote an article uh, about how um, ISPs should react when people ask for uh, user information and caught the attention of a couple of in-house lawyers at Rogers and uh, kind of became a law and technology lawyer, which in turn had me working with our technology group, which at the time did two things. It did kind of outsourcing agreements and things like that. And it also worked for small tech companies. and and. Um, so I found myself practicing a lot of IP law and I didn't know anything about IP law, like nothing. I, I had not taken IP in law school. There was no survey course or maybe that was taught by a visiting prof or something, but you know, I, I had not taken a single course in law school, but there I was an IP lawyer because what we were doing at the time was mostly copyright and trademark. Then Tories decided that it wanted to get into patent law. Um, and so they hired Andy Shaughnessy, who's been a longtime friend, partner, mentor of mine. And Andy and I started working a little bit together, but, but at the time the view was, oh, you know, people with a scientific background are important. Um, I went off to grad school, Andy, and Sheila Block won a huge case for Pfizer. Uh, and by the time I got back, we were getting a steady dose of work from, 
I Kentucky with a new witness. I'm like, what are we going to do when we get there? He was like, we're going to meet this witness and we're going to talk to him about this patent and we're going to have barbecue. And so we went, uh, we went and uh, we, that was kind of the beginning of my career. And then all of a sudden I was thrust into this world of patent law that I had previously known nothing about, less than nothing about. Uh, everything I knew was what I learned in, um, in grad school the year before. So I'd been practicing, practicing, practicing. Um, I went off to grad school. My wife and I kind of thought that we had found the right time to, to do this. And uh, so we had a one-year-old at the time. And so she, we went, she mostly took care of Josh. I mostly went to school, although, you know, LLM life is fairly leisurely. So I also got to spend a lot of time with Josh and, uh, and, and came back to Tories into the, you know, it didn't want to give up the rest of my practice, but was very enthusiastic about the IP practice. And uh, so as that practice got busier and busier and busier and busier, more and more of my time went into IP. Um, it's not, it's still a great practice and we still do lots of work, but uh, it's not as crazy as it was in the early 2010s. And so my practice is adjusted accordingly. Andrew, I could go on and on. This has been a, a blast. I loved listening to your stories. Uh, I know how uh, valuable your time is and how busy you are. I, uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed maybe for a part two in the future. Sure. Uh, let's count on this video to be a, a total hit uh, on, on my channel. I, I'm sure it will be. I want to say thank you. And uh, I uh, really look forward to watching this and listening to this over and over on my, on my drives to work because uh, there are so many layers and uh, um, so many um, details in the stories that you told us today. I mean, it's really great to interview extroverts also, right? Obviously, <laughs> I love that. So thank you so much, Andrew. This has been a blast. I really appreciate it. What's that? I'm the world's best because I'm Sorry, I think I think the internet connection is letting us down a little bit. Here, but okay, you're back. Okay, yeah, we uh, had to disconnect for a short while. I, I think the internet got overloaded with uh, with the uh, weight of your stories <laughs> and bailed out on us. <laughs> so, so thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun talking to you. Thank you.